So, hi folks, thank you a lot for coming and thank you for inviting me as well. Uh, my name is Andre and I came to talk here about PsychoJS, a framework uh, that I'm building, or I built. And I've, I've noticed people think quite often that it's this very exotic framework and a very weird way of structuring your apps. And they also think it's really hard and challenging but it was actually s built to solve real-world problems uh, while maintaining an elegant and simple architecture. So this was part of my work at Futurize. Uh, I was building some reactive programming uh, apps with, I mean, Android apps with RxJava. And then after I did some Java and Android, I, I went to do front-end and JavaScript. And uh, the, the situation in JavaScript and, and front-end is better than Android because, like, Java is so uh, Java and Android have really bad APIs, but then on the front end side we have stuff like React with much better sort of abstractions, virtual DOM, etc. Um, so, but I was still kind of constantly bothered with the the front end solutions. I had this feeling that you know this doesn't feel right. You know, th there has to be a better way of doing stuff. So I started applying uh, reactive programming ideas, made some patterns, and then I finally figured out this pattern. I named it. CycleJS. We've been building in that kind of stuff. At Futurize, we have this program called Spice Program where uh, they sort of pay me 15 euros per hour to build CycleJS on my free time, not work time. And it's not just me, they give this bonus to anyone else that builds any kind of open source thing on their free time. Um, and I also had two weeks of work time to build uh, PsychoJS to write the documentation and stuff. The point being that all of this is related to real world work. I mean, it's not just a hobby project. Uh, actually, the first prototype of PsychoJS was in a customer project. And I wanted to really solve problems. And the problems that I wanted to solve were these. I want to be able to answer to my boss or customer, yes, I can do that. And I also wanted uh, the architecture to be elegant and basically centered on one idea. And yeah. So just imagine that this guy here, Bill, uh, is your boss or your customer. And he's the person behind uh, the business, and he, he, he doesn't really care about front-end. He doesn't care if you use Angular or React or S Backbone or jQuery. He just cares about revenues, costs, users, marketing, that kind of stuff. So Bill comes to you one day and says, like, hey, can you just go ahead and make an animation uh, when an item is added to the list? And you're like, sure, sure, I can do that. Anyone can do that in React or Angular or whatever. And then he says, OK, so can you just go ahead and make an animation when the item is removed from the list? And then you're like, well, it depends. If we're using React, then it's technically an, an unmount of the component. So I think we need to use React Transition Group Wrapper to keep the component alive to animate it. But then we also need to give a hard code of duration because it's CSS transition. So if you want to sort of interrupt the animation between, then you know, Bill's just going to go kind of like, Okay, let's not make the exit animation. Just, you know, yeah. So then Bill the other day comes and says like, hey, could you just render this front end from the back end so that we can get SEO because my you know, business needs to get better. And then if you're using React, it's like, sure, and just do that. It's done. But if it's Angular 1, you're like, no, sorry, Bill. Like, you can't really do that with Angular 1. But Angular 2 is much better. But we can't really port stuff from Angular 1 to Angular 2 uh, because it's like a lot of work. And Bill, Bill has no idea what Angular is. And he knows that this other folk, that y these folks that use React, they can render the, the front end from the back end. So you know, he's just going to give you this face if you, if you just say that Angular 1 can't do, do uh, server-side rendering. Or, or isomorphic or universal, whatever they call it. What if your application has multiple uh, requ AJAX requests to do before rendering the HTML? When do you decide to stop and sort of ship the HTML from the server side? Are you going to tell Bill that it takes two hours or two weeks? So that's the type of stuff that Bill cares. He wants you to get stuff done as soon as possible and, and without ex excuses. You, he wants to hear from you that, yeah, I can do that. Um, so, 
uh, getting stuff done without really caring about uh, architecture has led to things like jQuery um, uh, abuse. And it's interesting that the motivation for PsychoJS is the same motivation as in jQuery, it, which is to um, do more with less code. So try to remember how web development was seven years ago. You basically just had jQuery. That was the only thing you should have imported. And you did whatever with it. You did Ajax, animations, changing the DOM, whatever. Um, and it, w it was quite nice, you know? It was kind of like a sword that in, in your medieval adventures and stuff. So you could just use that and nothing else. You could get a lot of stuff done. But uh, you usually, uh, the faster you did things with jQuery, you just left the mess of spaghetti behind of you. And then soon the, uh, the whole thing is a real spaghetti. And that's why we started making frameworks. So why can't we just keep things simple and maintainable and still be able to say can do to build and say like, yeah, I can do that in like two days or one day or something. This is what I want to achieve with PsychoJS. I want to do more with less code, but I also want to keep the code clean and maintainable without spaghetti. Uh, let's look at a demo of what this PsychoJS looks like. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to do some live coding, and if I do some mistakes, please correct me. So, here we have this app here that we made, and every time I just press a letter, like D, it appears, and if I press again, then it just toggles to disappear. So if I press Z, Z shows, and that kind of stuff. So then Bill just comes to me and says, like, hey, can you just make, make an enter and an exit animation for this? So instead of just suddenly popping up like that, it was, it was sort of gradually appear and then gradually disappear and also should be able to handle the interruption. So uh, here we have this app. It, it has a view which basically takes a stream of state and it maps that to a stream of virtual DOM and that's how we get that there. So how do we make this animated? <coughs> well, I'm just going to hack this quickly over here. I'm going to make animated state stream and I'm just going to call animate state and then um, Instead of using state, we're going to use animated state. And these are objects that describe the animation state. And each of these, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to show the key. And here, I mean, instead of using the uh, constant 50 pixel font size, I'm going to animate that uh, pixel. I mean, that font size. So I need to make this become a function that takes the animation state. And then instead of 50, we're going to interpolate that. Um, I think it's value. And we're going to make that the still button. This is kind of how we start. So I just need to make a function called animate. And you're probably not going to understand everything I'm going to do right now. But I'm just trying to get things done without adding a library here. Okay, that's the idea. I just want to hack around stuff, make it happen, and, you know, do it. Bill, I can do this. So here we go. We put state stream. We take it pairwise. We flat map the before with the after. And then we want to make uh, the array of... of um, points that are being added. So points are basically this animation state. So everything that is added will receive like this entry in animation. We do that by calculating the difference of after minus before. This difference from comes from uh, uh, Lodash. We take each of these keys and we map them to an object. Ooh. Object here saying key and it also says the current value is zero because that's what we start when we do an enter animation and the target is one. So it goes from one to z uh, zero to one and that's what the enter animation should look like. And then we have almost the same thing but for removed points it's before minus the after. And the initial value is one and it's going towards uh, zero. And then we make the array of all the points, just added points, concatenated with removed points, and we expand that as an observable uh, of the points. Then we flat map latest each of these points to an observable of interval 10 milliseconds. We get each of those ticks of 10 milliseconds, and we map that to the point 
then we take at most 100 of them, and then I scan, take you know, the accumulator and a current. Scan is like a reduce. You all like redux, so basically this is the same thing as reduce. And we start with the empty array, and then we sort of need to make the new accumulator. And in order to do that, I first need to get the index of where that current point is in the accumulator. Do that with find index. For each of these p's, we want the p that matches this key of the current point. And if that index is uh, minus 1, so it wasn't there, so the current per point was not there, and the current point target is one, so this is an enter animation. I'm going to add that point to the current target, but I'm going to do that in, in a mutable way by adding the point there. Otherwise, I'm going to just set uh, the current point to be that index, but also going to just clone it in order to be immutable. Accumulator slice will just clone it. And now I'm going to make the progressed accumulator, which is the new accumulator mapped. Each of these new points, I will map them to a progressed point, which will take everything from the new point, except the value will be something else. For that, I need the target, which is new point target. And I need the old point, which is accumulator, uh, find the p such that p key equals new point. And if I make a mistake, I actually have candy here. In case you find a mistake, please tell me as soon as possible. You're going to get a reward. Um, and then the value is, well, if we had an old point, then we're going to use the old point value. Otherwise, we use the new point value. And then the new the, the value of this progressed point will be, well, it depends. If we're quite close to the target, target minus uh, value is very small, then we're just going to go directly to the target. Otherwise, we're going to use the value plus some small increment. That will make us go towards that um, target a little bit more. Now that we have this progressed one, we're going to get the sanitized accumulator. Take progressed accumulator, just filter out the, these points. I don't want points that are uh, like this. The target is 0, and the value is also 0. And then I'm going to sort this sanitized accumulator by using sort by key. OK, and then I return this sorted accumulator. It should work. There we go. So now I have an enter animation, and I have an exit animation. And if I sort of interrupt this in the middle, it sort of doesn't start like, it doesn't give this weird jump. And then we can get this kind of 60 frames per second nice animation. And all of that was just hacked around quickly like this. So then you're thinking like, yeah, this looks pretty messy, right? This looks like spaghetti. Um, so how can we improve this, right? This is hacked around. So uh, that's actually pretty simple. We have some clear parts here, like we have this part, we have that part, we have uh, this bigger part here. And what we can do is just really move this away like that. We can put in a function, let's call it, uh, let's say, determine delta points. Uh, it takes the state stream and it returns that. Woo! Woo! Yeah. And then I, ta I just say return state stream, but I'm going to call this determine delta points. And then I can take this part, I can put it out. I'm going to call this um, expand as rendering frames. It takes a point stream and it returns the point stream like that. I'm going to also call that, can't forget. I'm going to take this big, huge n scan, I'm going to move it out as well, put it in a function. Let's call this one calculate animation steps. Also takes a point stream, move that in, and it returns point stream and scanned. 
We also call that here. So now this animate function is pretty small, right? We just refactored it, and I guess it still works. It does. And, but this still looks quite ugly. It's pretty much spaghetti, in my opinion. But gladly, it also has some distinct parts. This is one part. That's another part. So let's just extract this also. Let's call this one uh, incorporate new point, given the accumulator and the current point. Let's put it inside there. And let's return this uh, new accumulator. OK, and then we need to call that. Can't forget, new accumulator is incorporate the new point, accumulator and current point. And then this is also another part. I'm going to move that away. Function, uh, let's call this progress each point. Takes the old accumulator and the new accumulator. And it will return this progressed accumulator. OK, and now I need to remember to call it here, progressed. Accumulator is progress each point, accumulator, new accumulator. Does it still work? It does. So we want, just went from hacky code to nice code. All of these functions are pure, so it means you can test them without sort of like in invasive mocking. And we have, you know, really all the functions here are quite small. You could move this whole animate stuff to a util, or you can even publish it as a library right now. So uh, that's the point, you know, you should be able to just hack stuff, but you shouldn't like create a trace of ugly code behind. So refactoring this was pretty simple. Okay, let's look at another thing. So um, let's say, you know, you have a single page application here uh, like that, and, you know, it just has an about page and a home page. Okay, it's really, really simple. And it's built here with this function here, and as, as you can see, you know, there's the render home page, which has the section there, and it has the about page, has another, another section. These here are, are used down there, so if the route is uh, just slash, then we render the home page, that kind of stuff. So then Bill just asks you, like, hey, can you render this front end from the back end? And you're like, sure. So this uh, app function uh, can be used in a server. So this server.js here um, uses express. And for each of these requests, we sort of build some arguments here. Um, this wrap with boilerplate takes that app function that we had, and it sort of wraps with these basic stuff that you need, like, you know, HTML and head and title, and also the actual JavaScript uh, code that you're going to send uh, as HTML. It needs to be there as well. So, and then we just run that. We get an, a stream of HTML, which we, which we send here as uh, the response. So that is actually running right now here as a server. Just make that a bit large. So it's running if I do like home, then, oops, uh, well, yeah, d refresh the page, and I got there get slash for the home page. And then it just, the virtual DOM just rendered that as a string. But if you look at here on the client side, we have a, a different path. So basically, it gets the HTML from the server, but then it also on the client side renders that same thing on top of it. So it's kind of redundant. So how can we get rid of that? Like, sounds like an, a bit annoying problem, right? Well, it's pretty simple here uh, with the uh, Client.js, this is what ships is, is what shipped to the browser. Uh, this is really uh, the stream of all the renderings, and we can do something like this. We can say skip one. Skip the first rendering. So now it's uh, recompiling the server, I think. Uh, just a second. Um, yeah, so now if we run this, we won't see any more this uh, first different patch because we're just skipping the first one. And then all the uh, rest still work. So, for instance, I could put skip 10, and you want to see what that does if it recompiles. Um, it's going to run soon, yeah. So now it's skipping all the first 10 renderings. So if I try to render a, the about page, it's not going to happen. Uh, that was the first. If I try to render the home page, it's not going to happen. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. 9, 10, and then it starts working. So skip one, just really eight characters, and you get, can get your functionality. 
uh, back to the presentation. So how does all this madness work, right? So how does PsychoJS work? Uh, of course, that demo, you know, you're not supposed to understand everything. That it was just a demo, really, like, hey, this is how you can do stuff. Um, I was looking for a simpler, cleaner way of building apps. So I looked at this diagram, human-computer interaction, okay? Uh, this is what happens in every user interface uh, program that you can find. Just take a careful look at this diagram. It starts from the left there with a the user that has a brain, fortunately, and then um, they use their hand to control some com keyboard, mouse, whatever. And then that goes to the computer through uh, the hardware and the, the driver in the operating system. Then it finally gives an input event to your app, which is there on the far right. And then your app does some stuff, and then it's supposed to generate sort of an output event, which will then go to the driver in the operating system, which will go to the hardware, and finally to your screen. Okay, so the computer there is acting like a function. Okay, it takes input events and it generates output events. It's if it does that, then it should be a function, right? So there is no way that you can change this diagram. This happens for every app that exists. It's the truth. But why is it that when we write apps, it doesn't look like this at all? I mean, really, we don't make uh, apps that are a function that take input and generate outputs. So my goal was to create an abstraction that looks as close as possible to reality. So if you look at all of these devices, all these crazy devices, what happens if you only look at these two? Okay, you Imagine you have speaker and you have a microphone. What would that be? So it's basically a musical instrument or some kind of audio device, right? How do musical interfaces work? Signal processing. So traditionally, audio, audio signal processing has been analog, but nowadays, you know, they're all digital and stuff. So the signal processor is really just a computer, and you know, if you take a s input signal there, the sine wave, then to generate distortion is really just a pure function that you know shapes that uh, uh, signal. So musical devices are user interfaces, and it turns out that the most natural abstraction for uh, user interfaces is signal processing, because as you remember the human-computer interaction. So there's nothing really new with this, okay? You take an input signal, you transform it through some functions, and you, take, you generate the output. So this, for instance, here is a human-computer interface. I, I suppose all of you know what a guitar pedal is. Uh, the human contr controls the guitar, and that sends an input signal through that input socket there, and then the pedal just shapes the signal and generates this output signal. And the pedal is a pure function, okay? Why is it a pure function? Because the pedal doesn't generate side effects. So if you take the pedal and you put it near your ear, you're not going to hear anything. Uh, and that's true even if you have the input plugged in. You only have your guitar and you plug it into the pedal and you put your pedal in near your ear, you're not going to hear anything. So the pedal does nothing. If you look at it, it does nothing. It just transforms what comes in and generates uh, output. So uh, let's look at a demo. Uh, we're going to build a virtual guitar pedal. It's not going to take that much time uh, because I already built it. Uh, so. I made the PsychoJS app that takes this MIDI controller. Okay, this is my guitar. Yeah. And it sends signals. It's literally wired to my computer. It sends signals to the computer. And there, then I have this uh, audio output, you know, kind of like the headphone uh, plugged he here uh, to the computer, and that's going over there to the guys. And that is the output. Okay, so I have, in, in the same way that, I ha that we have the pedal, this is now a pedal, except I, I won't put my foot on it. Um, and so why can't the computer now do uh, the the function of a pure function, you know, w that's the idea here. So main is our pure function, which takes sources, are our inputs, and one of those sources is MIDI. So it's all the signals that come here through this uh, device. And then you can do stuff like this. Um, knob one, we can filter for all, all of the messages that have this certain ID. 
so I have one of these knobs here is knob one, and if I move that, then you see in the console log there that it has a payload, you know. So that's a signal as well. If you actually plot this in a mathematical plot, you know, it's going to be a signal, really. And so the idea is to generate the output signal using this, uh, these signals from these knobs and stuff. This is not dry code, okay? Don't look at it. It's really just hacked around quickly. So one of the things we can do is, like, for the first uh, pad here, we have two possible states. We have down or up. So we take the down uh, presses and we map them to a sound which has a note and the up is mapped to null, so basically no sound. So when it's down, it, it has sound, and when it's up, no sound, like that. So I do that with the others, and they all have different uh, notes. Then I can merge them all together from all of these eight pads, and then there's also some knobs are working as gain, release, and distortion. And then what is sent uh, out as an output is this signal of all of the instructions that should happen on the web audio, and w these are called drivers. And the idea is that you know think of uh, of the uh, human computer in, in interaction graph, and the thing that was between hardware and your program was drivers in the operating system. So that's why this is called driver, because, of course, to interface with this MIDI driver, uh, MIDI controller, I need a driver that talks to my app. So that's the idea. So I'm sending, uh, I'm getting instructions from drivers, and I'm setting instructions to drivers. And that's how we can achieve this app here, which, you know, I can move this knob, first knob for gain. And the second knob is uh, release. So this is no release. This is some release. And the third knob is a Boolean false or true for distortion or not. So no distortion, some distortion. Uh, then you can do stuff like, you know, Stuff like that. And then because this is all signal processing, uh, we can do even like for every sound that I will produce, we can just shape that signal. For instance, I can get that signal and sort of delay it by one second. So what does that mean? It means that when I press this, it will play the sound after one second. So I press it. That type of stuff. So, which allows you to do actual the musical idea of merge, which of, of delay, which is uh, we take that sound that we had before and we merge it with itself delayed. So we can do something like that to get a sort of musical idea of delay. So, that because we have two of them. They're just a bit delayed in time. So that's the idea of, uh, you know, building stuff with signal processing. So, why can't user interfaces be different to what I just described? I mean, if we have microphone or MIDI controller and, and speaker, we have a signal processing app, but what if this would be a mouse, right? It's plugged to the computer, at least in desktop computers, it's plugged into the computer. And the screen is also an output device, just like a speaker, right? I mean, sound is one dimi dimensional uh, waves, but then the screen is like a two dimensional, it's image processing. Image processing is also signal processing. So that's the idea that we use to build like normal apps, you know? So, for instance, uh, this here is, is what a signal of clicks look like, and you know it's just a stream of event clicks. And at the bottom, you have the signal of numbers, which is the amount of times that were clicked. So, in the beginning, there's zero. Then, after you see one click, there's one, and that kind of stuff. So, the application there is just a pure function, just does signal processing. So, let's try to do that as well. Let's go back here, and I'm going to build a counter app. Okay. Uh, basically, so we start by doing this. We we make a, the, an object of syncs, and syncs is basically all of your outputs. Okay, everything that will go to drivers in order to communicate with the screen. And for now, I'm going to have a constant signal. Or oh, sorry. So I'm going to tell that the, for the DOM driver. Okay, imagine that the DOM is a, is a device, and the for the DOM driver, I want to send a signal of uh, of a virtual DOM. So I'm, ha I'm going to have a div that has a button with the class uh, decrement and the label decrement, and then I'm going to have ooh, almost the same, but 
for increment. And then I'm going to have p saying value is 0. So I have this constant signal. Really, think of signal processing. This is like boom, quite boring. And then if we run that, ooh, nothing happened. Can anyone see a mistake? No, I'm not going to. This is too easy. OK, yeah, just forgot to return that. So there we go. This is a constant signal. And because it's constant, you know, we're not really using the inputs, which are coming from sources. And because we're not using that, nothing's going to really happen when we click on this. So what is the input that we want to receive is uh, the mouse. So how can we use the signal of mouse? Um, well, we do something like this. We have the, the decrement stream which is from uh, the sources, we're, we're going to listen to things happening on the DOM. Imagine the DOM is a hardware. And we want to select uh, those that part of the DOM, which is under the decrement, uh, decrement selector. And we want uh, events of type click. And for each of those, we will map uh, each of these click events to plus 1. The num oh, no, sorry, decrement is minus. And then almost the same thing for increment. Then increment is plus one. Now we have a uh, decrement stream is basically every time you click, it will be uh, minus one, minus one, minus one over time. So we need to make the stream of the value, which is uh, that uh, those numbers accumulated. So we do, uh, let me first join these two guys together. I'm going to make an action stream. You can think of action as really like a flux action. Just uh, merge them together. Merge the decrement with the increment, like that. And then uh, this would be the action stream, uh, except I start with the value 0. And I scan, which is the same idea as reduce. And if you all like re redux, then this is the same thing. So we're just, uh, we have the previous state, which was 0. And we have the new action, which is y. And that's what we do. We just add 0 plus the new number. And then once we have value stream, we take value stream, and we map that, each of these values, to this virtual DOM saying, you know, that. And then we get this decrement and increment. So, and how could we visualize this as kind of like a guitar pedal? This is uh, one really good vi visualization. Um, just make it bigger. Um, woo, I have no internet connection. Wow. Uh, just a second. This is a pretty good visualization. Uh, would it be globby? Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Deserve one of these. You want salmiak or chocolate? Sorry, I'm a sugar-free diet. Okay. So none. OK, later you can see what I have here. So uh, this here is our app. OK, everything in the black box is our app. And it has, you know, it has, it's displaying on the screen. And then um, the, whenever I click here, that generates an event that is mapped to one. We merge that, and then we accumulate it over time. And we generate a virtual DOM as the effect to go back to the DOM driver, which changes this counter. So if I just press decrement, increment, decrement, increment, minus one, one will be merged. And this will be accumulated over time like that. Unfortunately, I press plus and minus. So we're going to get 0 in the end. But Look at this. This is a cycle, really. And because that's what happens, same thing with the human computer in interaction diagram, is that you know, stuff from the user, from the clicks, will be processed here as a, as a signal processing unit. And we're going to produce this out. So it just keeps on going. Cool. So let's go back. And that's basically how. Um, the CycleJS apps are. They are a function that takes inputs and generate outputs from uh, drivers. Sort of the idea of drivers is that you have this hardware stuff or basically effects that you want to produce in the outside world. Okay, and it's also 
pretty uh, much refactorable. If you remember the animation demo that I just showed, where I was extracting all the all the stuff, that was you know really easy to refactor because there's no this keyword, there's no class. It's really just move this part there, move that part there. It's kind of like slicing it, so it's pretty easy. So if you have something like this, like we built the um, counter app, everything in between uh, source and sync is the main function. So if you weren't satisfied with uh, this code here. Uh, it's pretty easy to refactor this. I just say, okay, this goes to in, uh, intent. I'm just going to call this intent. Uh, take sources. Going to put that there. I'm going to return action stream. Nice. And then I'm going to put this in something called model. Takes the action stream. And it's going to just return this value stream. And then uh, this part down here we can put in... Uh, something called view, right? Because that's what views are. They get state and they, uh, I'll just call this value. They take state and they generate um, a stream of virtual DOM, basically how it should display it. And then you can do uh, view the model of this intent sources. And it should still work. And it works. So, you can just slice it anywhere you want, and that's how it's easy to refactor. But it's also pretty much testable because everything here is a pure function. Like, there's no crazy classes going on. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm switching too much between these two. But um, take a look at this main function now, right? It only takes sources and syncs. It's pretty easy to test a guitar pedal, right? You just plug stuff and check if it's working. So, uh, here's, a, for instance, a mocha test that checks that. Uh, given three increment clicks it, and one decrement click, it should show the value too. And here's our main function. It's there as a function, you know. And I just generate this um, fake uh, click events. So I have here, on the increment button, I generate this stream of three fake clicks. And on the decrement button, I generate this stream of one fake click. I give that to the main. The main generates uh, some messages to be sent to the DOM driver. I look at those messages and I check, does the virtual DOM element look like this? It should have their value is 2. And uh, this had uh, happens without the use of the DOM. So you can run this on Node.js without Phantom JS, and you know it's really just a JavaScript code without any DOM or any kind of effects because the main is really pure. That's what it means to have testable code. And it's also composable as well because if you notice, if the main is just a function, it's just a pure function, and it looks like a guitar pedal, then of course you can compose guitar pedals together to make uh, more awesome stuff. Because as, as we saw, you know, the main is a function, so why can't you just call that function in other places? And you can. So once you have any Cycle.js app, uh, it's actually magically uh, a component that you can use in anything else. And that's a really great properties, like hardcore modularity ev everywhere. Now, uh, RxJS costs time to learn. I'm not going to say that Psycho.js is easy. It's not. I mean, Rx is used everywhere in Psycho.js, and um, you can't do Psycho without knowing Rx. And learning Rx is hard. I'm just being honest here, you know, but it's also very rewarding. Uh, you will have these kind of like superpowers uh, after learning it, and you know you can be able to do really like powerful stuff with a few lines of code. But it's also really good investment for your career because there's Rx Java, there's Rx Swift, uh, there is Rx.net, and these are all serious stuff. I mean, if you just check the Android community, Rx Java is huge there, and it's like the, one of the main tools that they use. Uh, same thing with iOS. There's Rx Swift and Reactive Cocoa, and if you want to do, I mean, really, if you learn RxJS, RxJava is the same, and if you want to do Windows development, there's Rx.net, and you know. Actually, Rx came from um, Microsoft, so it's really strong there with the Microsoft products. So it's a huge investment, and it has like di direct application. Once you learn RxJS, you can directly apply that in uh, many other contexts. But there's also indirect uh, benefits if you want to do some Scala. Then dealing with collections in Scala is really the same way as dealing with observables in RxJS. If you see there, there's like flat map, map, there's count by, there's group by, window. All of these. 
exists in, in, in RxJS, and I can pretty much understand this even though I've never did any Scala. So it's basically the same concept. Not just Scala, but you have this kind of API also in Haskell and Elm as well. And this guy here said something about PsychoJS is that by learning Cycle and also Redux, it has helped him to digest uh, the intimidating uh, Haskell. So the point is, if you learn Rx, uh, Rx and Cycle, you're not learning like this niche skill that's going to be obsolete in a year or less. You're actually learning the basics of functional programming with collections. So it's much more worth to invest on this type of knowledge than other um, ephemeral uh, front-end libraries. So if you don't know where to start from, just Google for introduction to reactive programming. Uh, the first two links are stuff that I, I made. Uh, the, one, the first one is uh, the blog post where I explain reactive programming to uh, people who've never seen it before. And the second one is, a, is an online course of videos each video is like really short, two minutes or something. And I'm going to be releasing more videos there. There's also other instructions, putting in instructors putting videos there. If you're into books, there's also a book about it. And that's basically it. Thank you, folks. And if I hope this was useful to you.